Welcome to another episode of Activista Rise Up. I am your host, Dr. Patricia Campos Medina. You can watch this interview on all my social media or listen to it via Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. This month is Pride Month, and a time to celebrate the progress for the rights of our LGBTQ plus community. I must ask my guest today, I am excited to have Jay Lasseter, one of the most courageous leaders in New Jersey politics I know. He's a political consultant, a justice advocate, and an award-winning journalist, and a podcaster as well, and host of his own show, Heroin and Cat, for 101.5 FM. If I had an alter ego, Jay Lasseter will be it. He's fearless in the pursuit of truth and, and calls out elected officials and politicians or anyone for choosing power over people's humanity. I am calling our show Real Politics, not Real Politic, because I know that Jay and I agree. What is politics but making the impossible possible, even when it upsets the powers that be, and even when it takes a long time to build a movement and raise people's consciousness to transform what our society accepts as, as possible. Jay, I am so excited to have you as my guest in Activista Rise Up. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Patricia, very much. <laughs> thank, thank you for making the time. And I mean it when I said it, you are my alter ego. I see some of the things you write, some of the things you say, and the passion and truth of what you say, and I'm like, oh my God, I need to be like Jay. So <laughs> I would be very proud to be considered your alter ego. So if that's my reputation around Trenton, then I feel like I'm doing I'm doing a great job, if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel like we do not have um very difficult to uh, call out truth in New Jersey politics and sometimes it gets you in hot waters but sometimes it's okay to do that and we need to do more of that so I, I see that you know you and I are sometimes in the same hot waters and I appreciate your company when that happens and and, and for us to be able to critique each other because that's what it's all about right being honest about uh, what the, what the movement needs so I am excited to have you. Um, this show was um, started because um, a lot of people felt that they had no hope in building this movement in New Jersey. Like it felt like sometimes there's there's just insider politics and how we're building a movement. So I wanted to bring people who are, you know, committed to a cause and committed to moving the needle forward uh, in so many issues. And you're one of them. So it's Pride Month. We are yep. celebrating. Uh, you know, uh, the, the struggles of our LGBT community and you are part, integral part of that movement. So what are you celebrating this month thing? What is left, what, is, what are you working on on this, on this area? Pride fills my head with lots of thoughts. Um, you know, a lot of people think, you know, do we even need to do Pride anymore? There's a lot of outsiders that, you know, think gay people, you've got all of your special rights. Why are you still so demanding? Why are you ramming this all down our throat? And um, there are even LGBT people who are, you know, very uncomfortable with the police, you know? And so we're getting to the point where, you know, there are, there are so many different generations now, you know, because AIDS kind of wiped out a lot of generations in the old days. And that yes. was what pride used to be about. It was about AIDS. It was yes. about not dying of AIDS. It was about our friends who were dying. It was about the quilt. You know, it wasn't about, um, you know, having families and adopting children and, you know, buying a second home in, in Provincetown or whatever. And that's kind of what pride is now. So I think pride, it, it does have a little bit of um uh, you know, to answer like, wh what is the purpose does it serve anymore? You know, yeah. I do like the party. I think it's fun to go to a parade and have powerful people and powerful corporations show up and throw money at us and pander to us because I remember what it used to be like. Yeah. You know? And for the gay people or the LGBT people who think pride is too corporate, that we're, you know, we're in bed with, with the politicians, that we're, you know, on the side of the police, you know, I hear you. <laughs> All of those concerns are valid in this young generation that are just, you know, just they grew up 
having a bigger imagination than we were allowed to have. And they're more demanding than we were ever dreamed to be. And and I've passed the baton in many ways. Listen, what they, what this generation chooses to do with the baton. Sometimes I have thoughts about it, but you just have to trust them. You just have to let them go. Yes. And, and I have a feeling we're in good hands. This, this, this younger generation of LGBT Q kids who, who who were raised to be audacious, really, and, and taught to be proud and to be affirmed. Um, that's much more common among youth now. And, and there are still lots of places where it's very, very difficult and it's very painful to come out still. Yeah. So I think, you know, you asked me, how do I feel about Pride Month? And I kind of went around the block <laughs> a little bit with lots of different thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's AIDS, but it's also a, a, a party. It's um, it's families. It's listen. As long as people are calling me a faggot, I think we still need to have a Pride Month, and yeah. <laughs> that's my response to people. Listen, Patricia, I was, I was at a, a protest. It was an animal rights protest about a year ago up near the governor's uh, house because we were, we erected a billboard to get him to end the bear hunt because he promised he would do that on the campaign trail. Yeah. So there was a stop, there was a stoplight and cars would would stop and they would kind of honk and read our signs. And I remember at one point some guy yelled out. Ah, uh, look at you, just a bunch of stupid faggots or something like that. And and I remember I had the presence of mind to 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 get a really witty biting line back at him. I I ruined him. <laughs> Rhetorically, I I yeah. had a perfect comeback. But I remember afterwards just like being so like just humiliated by that. And I was like surprised cuz I thought, you know what? Those days are over. You guys yeah. can't hurt me now. But it did. It hurt. And it hurts to know that somebody would be so audacious they could just roll up and yell something like that out to a bunch of strangers um, in front of their, it looks like their kids in the back seat. And I just remember being much more devastated by that incident than I really thought I was. I'm an audacious guy. I've got thick skin. I can handle all of this. But sometimes it's those kinds of gestures that remind you, ugh. Well, it's still work to do. Yeah. What What if one of their kids would have been gay? Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, there were two or three kids in the back seat, you know, probably they weren't gay, but what if they were? And that's all I could think about. And I think that's a good reminder that um, even when we feel like, you know, we are okay, you know, in ourselves or what all those means, there's new, there's younger people who are still deciding whether this is something that they're ready to reveal to the world, right? So to me, um, my kids ask, you know, I think my kids are 10 years old and they say, mom, what is Pride Month? And I was like, it's about accepting everyone around us. You know, uh, it's about, you know, I say love is love. It's about kids who want perhaps feel like they're, you know, they're, they're a boy, but they, you know, they, they feel like they're a girl. It's about acceptance. It's about accepting all of us. So I, I, um, and I think that the progress is that we're able to talk about with our kids about that. But there's exactly. people who can't, you know, who, people who don't have those words yet. So another thing that you know, I, I, I totally agree. I think that you, we are in a better hands with the younger generation in terms of their acceptance and their willingness to to push the envelope. Uh, in our Latino community, you know, we have this. Uh, birth of the Latinx community, you know, which was actually um, response to the lack of acceptance of our LGBTQ community in the Latino and Hispanic culture. So now younger Latinos are calling themselves Latinx because right. they are demanding more acceptance of that, of, of, of the non-binary, you know, uh, uh, determination of sex. So I, I, I thank you for, for all that you have done to get us here and just to figure out, you know, what else is left to do. So I also know that I want to elevate something that you said about that the early movement of LGBTQ community was about like AIDS, about like the rights of, of the community. And you are a survivor of, uh, of, of AIDS. So I want to bring that up. I'm HIV positive, uh, 30 years in March, which feels like a, mir- a miracle, actually. And, and to be 30 years HIV positive and still fighting for equality, um, it feels like a pretty good deal. Listen, as long as I'm alive, I feel like I'm playing with house money. And it is, you know, it, it feels like such an, a meaningful thing for me to do with my life. I mean, people say like, oh, you're so brave and you do so much for the community. I'm like... 
I don't know what else I would do. <laughs> I don't, I, I can't imagine. Um, listen, there are a lot of gay people who have done nothing to fight for their own equality. And, and that's, that's fine because most people aren't activists. They don't yeah. have, they don't have that. They don't have the ability to lose and lose and lose and lose and lose and lose for a whole decade. And then maybe you get a shot at winning and then you lose anyway. And that's even more heartbreaking because you had your hopes up and then you finally get a little bit of a win. Yeah. And then once you get the win, you've got the next generation demanding more and more and more and more and more. So yeah. you almost have to be constitutionally able to accept that you are a loser, that your job <laughs> is to go through those losses to set the table for the ultimate victory. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, every campaign, I said, as long as we advance the needle a little bit, because when you're a social justice activist, you don't win everything, but you move the needle forward. And that's, I think that's what exactly. activism is all about, right? It took, it took, it took 30 years for the, sure. for the movement to get to a little bit of acceptance. Just like, you know, I, I'm an activist in, uh, for immigrant workers' rights and for women in equality. And that is, it feels like we're always losing, but, you know, we are advancing uh, the needle. We um, are so, definitely advancing um, the needle. And, and on the days where I feel, oh my God, like overwhelmed by the machine or, you know, staring at a really crappy legalization of marijuana program in New Jersey, when I like look at some of the evidence that tells me to panic, tells me <laughs> to freak out, and then I remember, you know what? Look back over these 15 years and little by little, you're moving, you're, you're changing people's minds. You know, most youngsters are straight, but you know, your boys will probably be straight because most kids are heterosexual, but they're asking, they're 10 year old, your twins, they're asking mommy, what's this all about? This yeah. is a conversation. It's not about sex. Like the, the evangelicals wanna make everything about gay rights, all about what we do in the bedroom, which, <laughs> <laughs> a very small part of it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so your your kids are growing up in an environment where they, as boys, don't feel ostracized just to ask their mom. It doesn't mean they're gay. It just means they're curious they're about curious. something that's observed. And so this is the climate that we've changed. So I, so I look at the the next next generation. You know, like the children of my brother. You know, your kids. You know, who are in in school now they're going to have a lot of problems to deal with like climate change and stuff. But this stuff about LGBT equality, this is not going to be an issue for them. And, and they don't have the same obstacles about coming to their parents about this stuff. There's just, it's just easier to have a dialogue with your kids about, Hey kids, not everybody is heterosexual. Yes. Um, yes. And, 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 it's okay. like and they're, and they're just as good as you and they're just as special as you are, you know? We're yeah. better. We're no, better. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we are because you have to deal with the bad and the good at the simultaneously, and still feel good about yourself. Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that um you know because of your activism and 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 and, and because you're an AIDS survivor, you got into the into the movement to also legalize marijuana because it wasn't a response to um you no know, to what you needed as medicine to cope. Definitely. So. You, how are we, you know, so you have been a leader on this. So what did we get wrong with the marijuana legalization in New Jersey? And where do we go from here? Oh, my God. So we <laughs> basically have gotten everything wrong. Yes. Um, first, let me just say that, like, the, the movement to reform our state's ridiculous marijuana laws the, the movement to legalize marijuana nationally and in the states, that is an extension of, of AIDS activism. And I am very grateful every time I get an opportunity to come on a podcast or to come onto a live stream or to go on TV or to write about this to remind people that it was, it was sick and dying queers and their caretakers. Yep. That's who started this. That is who set the table for all of this acceptance of, of marijuana as medicine and also you know, we're getting to the point where it's okay to smoke pot just because you want to get stoned. I'm 49 years old. I don't drink. I don't smoke cigarettes. I've never gambled. I haven't drank coffee in 25 years. I happen to like to smoke pot. I like the way it makes me feel. I like to be stoned and there's nothing wrong with it. So when I look at how sort of corporatized the, the marijuana industry has become in New Jersey, because 
listen, there's only about a dozen legal dispensaries in the state and yeah. there's a cartel and they are all very politically, they all have the best lobbying firms working on their behalf. Patricia, I remember when I found out that the dispensaries were hiring lobbyists and I thought, great, they're going to navigate the system and Chris Christie, you know, set up a ridiculous regulatory climate. But, but those lobbyists, they're not lobbying for us. No, they're lobbying no. against us. Against yes. us. So in New Jersey, you know, you're paying four to $500 an ounce for mediocre dispensary weed, which is, you know, okay. If, if you have the money to do that and you don't mind driving an hour, it's not very convenient. There's, it's not like going to the pharmacy. There are just a lot of barriers to it, including the price. And if you're a sick person or if you're a very poor person and you don't really have the solution you need from New Jersey's program, medical program, then, you know, you're going to go to the black market. And one thing I will say about, you know, Governor Murphy and in Trenton, like the fact that they had to do all these decriminalization bills that admitted that they couldn't handle legalization, that they didn't have the chops to do the yeah. real, the whole enchilada. So yeah. they do decriminalization. That's it. That's them admitting that, that they don't have the tool, that they, they can't handle it. Yeah. But I'm so glad that they did it because that means when I get my my cannabis from the black market, which I listen, I've been smoking pot the entire time I've been HIV positive, and most of that time as a criminal, including today. I don't go to the dispensaries. I can't afford the dispensaries, so I have a black market dealer, and you know, listen, she she delivers. She gives me a little line of credit if I'm not liquid that week. Yeah. It just says pay me back whenever. She, you know, if I don't like the strain, I can bring it back. Um, and, 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 and sometimes if I'm out of town, she'll deliver and even feed my cat. <laughs> this is an amazing it's, it's a business. Exactly. It's, a, it's, it's, a level of, it's a level yeah. of customer service that makes marijuana just consumers more discerning. And so we're going to go to a dispensary and, you know, they're going to shake us down for the money. Their weed is not that great. Yeah. Um, and they're they're getting fabulously wealthy, laughing to the bank, while the rest of us chumps are, you know, coughing up five hundred dollars an ounce for crappy medicine. The same politicians in Trenton who led the effort for medical marijuana, Nick Scutari, for example, the senator, um, he's the same guy who led the the recreational battle. And honestly, is it any wonder that it's really not that great of a result. I mean, you put yeah. this guy in charge who demonstrated his inability. Marijuana, medical marijuana in New Jersey is the worst in the country. It is, it was a disaster. And I would love to blame it all on Chris Christie because I hate him. And he was, <laughs> he was a rotten hearted sociopath, but it's not all his fault. Yeah. The Democrats have had a law, a full control for quite a while. None of the South Jersey Democrats wanted to legalize marijuana, except for the Troy Singleton who it's not a coincidence, he's he's not white. Yeah, Maybe he has a different idea of like how the war on drugs has impacted communities like his. So he's always been a yes vote for legalization, but all of the other Norcross Democrats, they wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't even really comment on it. And it was the same Democrats uh, who are kind of, I don't know, cowardly about marijuana reform. Those were the exact same districts that pulled the same stuff with gay marriage like 10 yeah. or 15 years ago. The same districts. In many cases, it's the same people. Yeah. Jim Beach, for example, you know, they had an opportunity to vote for gay marriage and all of them voted against it. Yeah. All of them in South Jersey, except for the late Jim Whalen, because he knew that gay people boycotting Atlantic City was bad business. And we would have, they already had enough problems. They didn't need a gay riot in Atlantic City. <laughs> so that's the only Democrat who voted for gay marriage the first time. Yeah. And in most of those, those districts, it was the same repeat performance for marijuana 10 years later. And I can't blame Chris Christie for that. That's not Chris Christie's fault. It's the machine Democrats rooted in South Jersey who have tremendous sway over which bills get posted and who ends up on these committees and who's voting on everything. Yeah. And so I guess that's where the buck stops. Yeah. And th I think that that's sort of um, a trend, I mean, not a trend, like a reality in New Jersey, how we have these Democrats, machine Democrats who call themselves progressive because everybody wants to use the label now, uh, you know, on issues and, and then over and over again, choose to vote to a, to appeal to a certain voting bloc that is much more conservative than us, than uh, the you know, voters uh, who care about marijuana legalization, voters of color 
who are usually more progressive on these issues yeah. um, than the regular traditional um, Democrats in, in suburbia. You know, and I exactly. think that, that <laughs> yeah. they, I mean, yeah. and, you know, and to me, what was, what was very frustrating about the marijuana legalization um, is, is that it became an issue that they wanted to get done when it became about making money and about some people making money and not about addressing concerns like like providing an option to opiates for people right. who were sick. Exactly. The original version of the medical marijuana bill included chronic pain mm -hmm. as a qualifying condition for medical marijuana instead of opiates, presumably, because a lot of times marijuana can help with anxiety or pain or you know it can help you sleep. It, it, it does a lot of things for a lot of people. So Herb Conaway, who is a very proud member of the South Jersey team, he is the uh, health committee chairman in the assembly. He would not hold a, a, a hearing on the bill until they took out home grow and chronic pain as a qualifying condition. Oh, and Lord. so these are two things that really kind of, I believe, contributed to the opiate crisis. This was, you know, 12 years ago. So suddenly marijuana, medical marijuana is off the table for anyone in, in chronic pain. So they're going to go to the most obvious solution to opiates because it's very easy to get that. And we've got, you know, our committee chairman creating a climate where it's easier to get opiates than it is to get locked up for weed for marijuana. Um, you know, this is Democrats making setting and the I, table. Yeah, I, you know, I, this is such a critical issue because um, addiction to uh, to prescription drugs is real. It continues to grow. It hasn't been unabated. And, yeah. you know, and how we are going to provide an option to that. I mean, use of marijuana doesn't equate to addiction. Addiction is a condition that needs to be treated like as, as an illness. So to me, are we doing any better on, 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 addic on addiction to opiates in New Jersey after the whole hula la of Chris Christie? Or are we still in the same place? I know you follow this issue closely. Well, it's... COVID made it really easy to ignore the opiate crisis, which I don't think is in the front of people's minds as it was. It was a very trendy thing a few years ago. People, you know, white people in suburbia started dropping dead of, of, of heroin overdoses in their suburban home. I mean, it started to affect people. <laughs> it was just like AIDS yeah. you know, back in the day. A bunch of people had to die for, you know, some somebody to die I don't know, to, to, to change, to seize the conscience of the yeah. state, of the country, there had to be a lot of a body count. Yeah. We didn't even like wake up until there was a lot of dead people already. So that happened with the opiate crisis. And, and, and we, we had a lot of talk about Narcan, a lot of candlelight vigils. And so I think there was a lot of work to end the stigma. And, and that is good. And we did that. And, and yeah. even Chris Christie actually helped to do that. But, you know, by the time Narcan is in the picture, it's too late. Yes, yes. We're not talking about prevention. You know, do you know how hard it was in New Jersey to put like, because, I mean, a doctor could prescribe like 100 pills to somebody who had a toothache, which yes. I think is creating a climate where people are going to get hooked on this stuff. But to do like any kind of modest limitations, and, and, and listen, there are people in chronic pain who, 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 could, who need like a lot of opiates. And yeah. they don't need any obstacles and their well-being is, is predicated on, uh, you know, them having as much access as they need. This is and they were used as an excuse to, like, just have a pipeline of yeah. more pills at higher doses uh, for longer durations to people at all ages. And so to, to, to fight to get a lot to put a very modest limit on the first prescription. So this is just the first time, like you know, the second and the third and the fourth times they write a prescription, there's no limits at all. Yeah, so this yeah. is a little bit of a let's give, let's take the power from the doctors because mm -hmm. this is where a lot of the heroin problems are starting. Like, like I don't know, nine out of ten people, you don't start shooting dope on a train track. You usually start on pills. <laughs> you get from a doctor. It it starts where there's less stigma. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I was, you know, we, we had um, older relatives who, you know, who were in pain and we kept saying, why can't we just get a, a, a some medical marijuana instead of giving them opiates? They're old. They don't need all the opiates and you could, and you will get a hundred pills and you're like, they don't really need that. It was so easy. Uh, and yeah. to me, that's sort of like, you know, like 
the difference, right? Like how how can you make that so easy to get, but then you you have to put so many restrictions on on marijuana. So we have a long way to go to make to make that change, yeah. and and also to provide you know the relief that some of our uh, African American and Latino communities need to be able to also make the understand that. You know, the, yes, marijuana criminalization was used against our communities to send a lot of people to jail. Exactly. And so there's, a, there's a lot of stigma on marijuana from our, on our Latino and black communities. And we have to work on that, but then not focus on it. I mean, this is like my huge, um, uh, like uh, critique of the marijuana promoters in New Jersey that they really are focusing on the making money part on the right. business side and not in, in helping the communities who were impacted understand, you know, um, get some relief for the for the impact that they receive for generations. You know, that a lot yeah. of our kids were in jail for on for, for selling an ounce of marijuana. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and, so in and many ways so I understand and you know I understand some of the people who critique Escusiari when he wanted to ram this bill because in reality we really haven't dig deep into how do we make those communities whole not uh, at all moving forward we have not done that and, and every time lawmakers in trenton have been confronted with the issue of expungement mm -hmm. they've that's going to be hard and i will i'll be the first to admit so so we have to make expungement free because we've admitted we we screwed up the yes. burden is on, on us to make you whole now. So having a complicated, expensive expungement process is that's anathema to, yes. to 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 what we're trying to do here. The burden is on the state to to fix this, and and that is what we've acknowledged by legalizing marijuana. We we screwed up a lot of families and a lot of people for many generations doing this, and so to make expungement easy and free is such a big lift because we're going to have to aim a fire hose of money. The municipalities are involved because it's going to be like every town. Uh, we're going to have to, the, the tools and the leadership that are lacking to take on something big like that are so not in existence in Trenton right now. And every time they're confronted with expungement, they kick the can. And yes. it's, it's because it's hard yeah. to do expungement right is hard. It's, somebody should just be able to go onto a, a website punch in their social security number, their pot offenses will pop up. And if they're nonviolent low level pot crimes, it should be easy as click, 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 bang. And then you get a confirmation and then you're good to go. Yeah. But if you've ever like paid a traffic ticket or something like that on NJ courts, it's kind of a mess. It's an archaic system. I mean, they're using computer programming language from the 1960s yeah. and stuff like our, I think our unemployment, uh, issues have revealed that these systems that New Jersey is operating on are like ancient history. Yes. It's a novel thing where, I mean, this is going to be a lot of expungements, tens of thousands, and we're so not ready for it. Yeah. And it must happen. I think we must continue to demand it because it's not fair that a whole yep. generation of young people, um, you know, got basically a stigma that will yep. hold them back from ever really having a exactly. decent job or opportunity. So it's not, it's a generational impact that we need to sort of rebuild. So we have a lot of work to do there. And, you know, you said something like it's hard. Yeah, it is hard, but that's why we elect politicians to do the uh -huh. hard things, right? <laughs> not to go along. Uh, and I had sort of um, just, I had a call yesterday from a, a, an activist who said it's so hard to be a Democrat and a progressive Democrat in New Jersey right now because it's like we're not doing much. We're like just passing the buck and I basically afraid of the Trump voters. And I'm like, what is the point of being empowered as Democrats if we are not going to act like Democrats? So exactly. how are you feeling right now about our Democratic progressive movement in New Jersey? The Democratic progressive movement that sprung out in reaction to Trump, and God bless them, because there's so much energy, there's so much vitality, and they don't have as many miles on the odometer as we do. Like, <laughs> we need that. But I also know that they're at a different stage in their activist career where, like, you got to, like, have some gut checks along the way. Yes. It's like, okay, so what happens when we accomplish that huge goal and like what's next what happens when we don't have like trump to vilify anymore and we have to like look inward at our own democrats like this is it's a challenge that not everybody is going to be up for 
but it's sort of like a, a reflection point for the, and I don't want to call them new progressives because that makes it seem like they're junior to me or something. It's not like that at all. It's these people who were driven to action by Trump and God bless yeah. them because, yeah. you know, look, look at how much more violent, like the activist community is because of it. But like, it's, it's a gut check time, you know, yeah. like how can we accept, you know, the fact that the wins are not always obvious. The fact that we're just about moving the needle, you know, yeah. and, and, and our presence here, even when it doesn't feel like we're winning, is still influencing the discussion. I remember when I was a young blogger at Trenton, I had, and this is just an example to like give hope to youngsters like that yeah. I would have never thought of. So I had a little camera on a tripod that I set up and, and it wasn't even on. I didn't even have any batteries in it, but just the presence of a camera in the committee room changed their behavior so much. I was like, well, that's interesting. Just my present. <laughs> this, I'm, my battery's dead. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just holding it here because it's next to me. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I saw how much just my presence, you know, what is Jay Lasser going to blog about us or whatever? Mm -hmm. it, it, it changed their behavior, even though it didn't make them vote the way I wanted to, or maybe it wouldn't make them pass the bill. It didn't give the direct result that I wanted on the day. But it influenced how they carried themselves. Yeah. And sometimes like just showing up uh, on those days where it feels like, I, what am I doing? Who am I influencing? Just putting like one foot in front of the, the other on those days where it's not obvious what you're contributing. That's your most important job as, a, as an activist. Yeah. Not the big hit with the media or the big, huge event where you're speaking or the, you know, the, the high highs. It's yeah. on the it's on the the days where you're not really sure like what your role <laughs> is. You're not even really sure if you're affecting any change yeah. on those days when you put one foot in front of the other. That's your and most when, important job. Is and when person. you have to have the internal debate about 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 what is it that you're really trying to accomplish? Because right now right. we have in this debate like okay, we can't really push Democrats too far because we don't want to wake up the Trump Republicans. I'm sorry, the Trump Republicans are still awake. And they they're, wide awake. Awake. Yes. they're the one and they will continue Ooh. to be awake. I job, my job as an activist is to make sure that the youngsters that got energized because Trump was so horrible, understand that there's things to still need to push forward with Repub with Democrats. Like I don't need Trump Democrats. I need real Democrats and progressive yeah. Democrats. Right. So that's why sometimes right now it feels like, there's this acceptance of, of Phil Murphy moving to the center and like uh, catering to, to machine Democrats and going along with George Norcross, which is something we fought for again, that we fought against, you know, when we elected him. So now it's like, how can we have that internal debate to say, listen, he is a Democrat. He has done some good things, but what do we need him to do next? And, and allow him just to go to the middle is just, just not enough. Uh, as if we are real progressive Democrats. So and that's the internal debate that I think we ought to be able to be having right now. And, and, and it's not always an easy debate. And and the answers aren't always comfortable. And, and sometimes when I tell these younger activists, I'm just like, listen, learning to live with that discomfort, learning to just to exist with that fury, you know, when you want to just... <laughs> like just learning how to live with those uncomfortable feelings of, of being in a world that wants to marginalize you where yeah. you're fighting against people that are stronger than you and richer than you and more powerful than you. Um, I don't know. Like it, it's not always the dopamine hit that fighting against Trump is sometimes, you know, you have to be more, and it's not a very satisfying answer. It's like, you've got to be, you got to think about it. Like for the long haul, you gotta, you gotta learn to lose. You got to learn to lose and <laughs> that's not a good like lesson. <laughs> that is a good lesson, learning to lose and learning something about yourself every time you lose. And, and I've lost so much over the years. And then you, like I told you earlier, you would lose five times before you even get a, at an opportunity for a win. And, yeah. and, and so the track record doesn't look great, <laughs> but like somehow everything that was radical about me 20 years ago is totally mainstream now. Like I am mainstream now. Yes. Yes. Old, isn't isn't that crazy that crazy. now we are mainstream? 
<laughs> it's okay though, because you know, when I think about the level of fury, that's hard to sustain. You know, it's hard to be furious for three decades. <laughs> that's what I always said. My job is to um, just help younger people to like stay furious and stay constructive and give it another 20 years because I am at the end of my, uh, of my, uh, of my cycle here. I don't want to be, I want to, I will still be doing this, but For sure. the, the furious in the streets, they are actually organizing, they're knocking on doors, they're getting people loud and excited. I think it's, it's, it's the, the new younger generation who needs to like pick up the baton and do it. And it's my job to say, what do I need to do to help you? You know, and that is what this show is about for me is saying, listen, don't give up, you know? <laughs> so the, um, the, 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 cause there were people who were kind of nudging me along when I was, listen, your job is a, you know, you're an educator. You like influence these kids. That's such a, it just, it, it must blow your mind to know yeah. that you influence these, these people. And, and even if they don't want to share your politics for the rest of, you know, you're going to have some impact on them. That, that, that's a role that I take pretty seriously. And, and, you know, and I tell these youngsters, I'm like, listen, just because you don't see me like in rage all the time, like now I just can send the governor's chief of staff a private message. I don't need to bring boots into the, you know, <laughs> yeah. we don't need to send the revolt. I can just send an angry email directly up the chain. And, and, and that's kind of a sign again. It's like, well, are we the establishment now? Like, am, am I not furious enough? Should I be more angry about this stuff? But it's about pacing yourself. Yeah. I am I, angry about everything. And it's okay to be angry. I tell people it's okay to be angry. Um, you know, I just thinking about you saying uh, we can send an email to the governor. And, and I, I always, I said, yeah, I can do that. But it, it, I had that access. But I need to turn that access into power for people or power for my issues. So I always have to be thinking, yeah, I could call him. I could call, you know, the top staff. But how am I building power so that they do what I need them to do uh, and not just take my call? Because exactly. people confuse. People confuse that. You know, people that take your exactly. call, they do what you, what you want them to do or you need them to do. Well, that's so, the thing. Yeah. Phil Murphy's campaign is like, didn't we throw a lovely pride reception for you people last year? How dare you <laughs> take him to task for being a hypocrite about machine party politics? Or, I mean, the thing is, like, I believe <laughs> Phil Murphy is incredibly smart. And yeah. he was very smart to use the power and the energy of the progressive grassroots in the beginning of his term because we, we elevated build, him. We that we him. built when we were fighting Chris Christie, you know? Yes. You know, we exactly. built that movement and all his demands and he delivered on them. Great. <laughs> but now what is he going to deliver on? That's what I'm stuck at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, that, think, how do we I think he's been a good governor. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, no. I agree. He has del he delivered like, on the movement that we built. Right. And I, you know, now we he, want he's, all the he's doing a pretty good job. Yes. You know, we yeah. want other things like, exactly. you know, we deliver on driver's licenses for the document, which we fought 15 years for. Now we want relief uh, for the for the undocumented during the pandemic. So it doesn't mean that we don't appreciate, exactly. what did, you know, for uh, driver's licenses. But now there's a new need and there's a new need, a uh, reason for him to act. I mean, is, there, is that a contradiction? You, you know, his staff is very defensive. Um, and, and I think that Governor Murphy probably understands why we're demanding, but the people that he's surrounded himself with who are very poll oriented and listen, his numbers are great and they don't yeah. think they're, they need to change. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. And so I have gotten feedback or heartburn from his staffers like, Jesus, Jay, what do you want? Aren't we X, Y, Z enough? And almost like I should be more grateful. <laughs> I like th that's not enough. Like giving yeah. me a seat at the table. Like <laughs> I, I'm not demand. I, I'm not trying to be a control freak. I, I I'm making these demands because I think it'll be a better deal for the taxpayer, for the citizens, for my values. Like I don't antagonize to make the governor feel bad or to look bad. And and I believe that some of the men, mostly that he's surrounded himself with, are very, you know, thin skinned about criticism, especially when they believe they've already done enough favors for us.
Yeah. God, and your games are so. I don't, I don't consider them favors. I consider doing right policy things that are the exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much and, credit do you want? Like, like they, they feel like I'm not. Like I get the like if you're not 100 percent loyal, you're disloyal. I mean, th that's. I feel yeah. like I've gone out of my way to compliment the governor to point out the context that that explains why it was harder for him to deliver on his promises. You know, the, the Republicans have been a, a brick wall of no. The South Jersey Democrats are always creating barriers to progress. I think the governor would be a lot better off if he had a little bit of support in Trenton from the Republicans and from the South Jersey Democrats who are committed to no. But yeah. like, I don't know, that doesn't make it right that that he's delivering half-baked products like the mar the marijuana legalization regime in new jersey i was talking to matt freeman a, a reporter for politico and jay and i told him that i thought it was dog shit, and he actually quoted that in his article i was like he didn't even he wrote it out dog shit, like not even a little x you know change a little bit exclamation each part of the word, put an exclamation point in there. And I was like, oh God, they're going to hate me for this. But the truth is, it is so terrible. That's just an accurate way to describe it. It's, I mean. This is when I said that you're my alter ego, because sometimes <laughs> I, do feel like, I do feel like saying the same thing. So it, it, I would, I would much rather be kissing their ass. Yeah. I like, to, I'm a people pleaser. I want to say nice things about people. I want to say honor and glory to Senate President Steve Sweeney, who showed the political courage to, to turn back the war on drugs because it was affecting people outside of his district or you know outside of his sphere of influence. I don't get opportunities to do that. The opportunities to give them the praise that they feel like they deserve, I don't think they come around very often. Yeah. They don't deserve me to kiss their ass. I voted for them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I said. I voted for you. You're a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. But in my job is to hold you accountable. Exactly. So, yeah. And that should not be a matter of loyalty or disloyalty. It's about making you address the issues that matter to people in your state, to people who need government help. You know, that should not be a problem. Exactly. But I do agree. We need to figure out how to get the, the legislature to be a little bit more progressive and less of a, of a, a Trumpian Democrats who like say no, 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 no. So we have a primary next week, uh, June 8th, and I thought it was appropriate that you and I talk uh, this week. Right. Is there anything that we can expect, any up, any upsets in, in any of the legis legislative races that could add a couple of progressive legislatures that we can count on to like shake the boat? I doubt it. But if anybody can do it, it's probably Valerie Huddle, who's running off the line up in Bergen County. And, you know, it seems like South Jersey Democrats want Gordon Gordon Johnson. And, yeah. you know, whether that will prevail on the people of Bergen County, running off the line without the blessing of the party has always been a tall order. And, you know, the people running on the line who mock me for suggesting that, I'm like, well, then 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 stop doing it. Yes. It's like you're talking about it doesn't the line. Matter. <laughs> they will fight till the death yes. to preserve their line, their their ballot design that inherently favors the incumbent um, almost 99 or some crazy percent of the time. The people who are, are telling us that the line doesn't matter are the ones that will like cut your mama to preserve the line as it is right now. They will cut your mama and <laughs> my mama and their own mama to preserve the status quo. But they're out here telling, oh, the line doesn't matter. You fake progressives, that's what they call me. I'm a fake progressive. Um, you're not winning, you know, they they want to make the line seem like nothing and yet they're completely yeah. devoted to ensuring it. So that yeah. that's a contradiction. Yeah, it's like you don't know how to run elections, that's what you lose, I, I, I hear exactly. that. And I said, yeah, because you have a 30 point advantage every time you run. So you don't know what it is like not to have that. Um, and even when you do, they like, you know, they, they just don't recognize it because we have won elections off the line and yet then they just work overtime to try to squish, uh, squash exactly. out that, that, that support. So how do we, um, you know, there is a whole movement to eliminate the line, which by the way, for everybody who is not from New Jersey, you don't know what the line is is uh, the Democrats having in New Jersey the ability to put all their candidates that the party endorsed on one line 
down the line with the governor or whoever is at the top and identifying as Democrats and anybody who challenged them somewhere else down Siberia. That's what the line is. And it's only um, existing in New Jersey. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the country. And that's Republicans the- use it too. I mean, you remember when Chris Christie was governor and Frank Lautenberg died? Yes. And, 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 and Governor Christie scheduled a special election because he didn't want to run against Barbara Buono with Cory Booker Corey at the Booker. top of that ticket. And yeah. so Chris Christie knows it. <laughs> <laughs> sure it's an advantage for the party machine. Exactly. That's what that is. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to run. He knew that the a line with Cory Booker at the top would elevate his competitor. Yeah. And so that 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 was proof to me that I don't know. Do you remember that when when Lautenberg died? And, and yes, I don't remember that. So they had, had to run exactly. for one year term and then had to right. run again. And it was and two weeks after, after the election. election. <laughs> yes, yeah. It could have been at the. It could have been on the November election, but Chris Christie like did a se- separate election because he knows the power of the line. Yeah. This is yes, the- that's what I always said that you know. Um, in New Jersey has a different way of, of uh, controlling who votes and who doesn't vote right. and who's, who gets to wrong, who doesn't get to wrong. And that's why, you know, like when, what's the intervention? Is it changing the ballot? Is it changing uh, how parties, you know, um, you know, how legislative districts get assigned Which you and I got in the hot waters for criticizing right. the, the legislative commission, uh, district commission. Like where is, the point of entrance to change our political system so that more people with more different opinions with women and young people can run. You know, where is the, the point of intervention? The point of, there, there does not exist, a, there has never existed a point of entry for people like you and people like me. You gotta, you gotta go up and you gotta, you gotta break the door down. You gotta kick the door down. Yeah. And, and that's what sucks is that like this merry-go-round never slows down enough for like people to comfortably get on and off. Like you have to take a big risk. You have to crash the gate. Yes. And, yes. and when I look at like, you know, how we're about to do another round of redistricting, which will probably entrench the status quo for, you know, another 10, 10 years. years. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the democratic, I mean, you know, the only reason the Democrats appointed one woman was because of us. Like if it wasn't <laughs> for us, it would have been five straight white guys. Yes, it would have been. <laughs> And they were so proud of their diversity because they had an Irish guy, an Italian guy, a Latino guy. So they had all these different kind of straight guys of different races. Yes. No women, no gay. So they appointed a woman. Bless her heart. She surely must know that she is a, gosh, a, a quota. A, yes. you know, a token. A token. And, <laughs> yes. and, and listen, I've been the token. Yes. yes. That's a shitty feeling. It, it is. It is a shitty feeling. But and sometimes, you know, if you if you don't go along, you know, because I have been in places that I'm the token, but then you have to choose. Do I go right. along to right. stay and get along or do I make a change? But if you push too hard, they kick you out. And you don't have to kick you out of the commission, but they kick you out of access and of power. So it's a it's a hard balance. So yeah. Yeah. immediately. <laughs> yes. I don't criticize the, the woman who was appointed to the registering commission, the Democrat, I cannot remember her name, but I don't know fault her. I don't blame her, whether she wanted to accept it and, and change things from within or, or however she wants to do it. Like I get it. If it was me, I would have been facing the same thing. I'd have like, well, doesn't it make more sense if I'm, you know, on this committee? It's going to be less bad than it was. Like, I don't want to make this sound like a critique of her. Like, she is um, uh, symbolic yeah. of of a diseased system. She's not the problem. You yeah. know, she she's not contributing to the problem. She's a you know, she's a byproduct yeah. of a system that favors the status quo. The token woman. Yeah. And, and, and we all know how that feels. And, and, and honestly, I think even though I don't remember her name, I mean, she's, yeah. she's more than that. She's more than a token. Yeah. And I'm sure that she, you know, she has had her battles to get to the point that she can get that recognition. And I, you know, I, I applaud that. Um, and I, I hope that she at least pushes a little bit of women representation and also more diverse women representation right. or, or ability for more women of color to run. Um, and because we need her there, and but we also need more of us there. So it's not like we are making any less of, of her position. 
The, um, um, we yeah. wouldn't be even having this discussion except for Trenton is like 70% male. What? or <laughs> White male. male. Yes, yes. There are no gay, no LGBT people in the state house. The, the number of women is something like, I mean, it's like 29% or something. 29%, it is a, yeah. It's a yeah. ridiculously small yeah. amount. And it's for women of color, it's like in the 10, 10%, you know? So it's we like, it, it is bad. And for as diverse as we claim to be, we need to figure out how to push the envelope and, and just have, have some progress on that on that level. And I'm totally, you know, you know, we are movement builders. And when you're a movement builder, sometimes we are not the ones who get in the door. Exactly. So it, but we get other people to get on the door and that's accomplishment. So it's not about me being there. It's about how many other people who look like me or exactly. are not white and male get in the room. And that's what pushing for, for representation in politics is all about for me. That's a selfless attitude. And sometimes I'm... I'm right there with you. And other times I'm like, why not me? Exactly. Like, <laughs> what, what have I sacrificed for my big mouth? What opportunities have I given up on? Because I can't take no for an answer, you know? And, and, and I think about the role of being the person that ho holds the door open for everybody else to go in. Sometimes I wish it was me going in. Yeah. And it's but okay. Yes, because you know way. you will hold the ground. Yeah. And uh, to a higher level. But one thing, and I don't know if this has happened to you, that I have to deal with, is that you, uh, your own people, other women or other women of color, are the ones who criticize you the worst for, for like, saying the uh, things that need to be said so that they can get on the door, you know? So, and that is sometimes, like, like when I say, well, you know, I should be the one in the door. <laughs> there, but, There's a gay version of that for sure. <laughs> I think it, it, it's just, yeah. I feel like some of the people that I, that I've held the door open for don't always appreciate it yet. And that's about being an older activist. You know, mm -hmm. if you're an elder statesman, you got to deal with those feelings. It's like, bitch, this isn't about you. This is about your values. This is about the future. This is about the long game. And sometimes I have to, I feel, yeah. I feel listen, it's a hard battle. You get down and you feel sorry for yourself sometimes. And then I remember, I've been standing here holding the door open for 30 years. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I, you know, there's some legislators who like, you know, I, um, I've been an activist with, with Lupe Pac for a long time. And we have had some real battles to get some Latinas elected in office and get some Latinos elected in office. They get kicked out. They get removed. And then when we hold, you know, and then when, when it's time to stand up for us and then they're like, oh, you can't say that. Oh, you're being too radical. I'm like, dude, you. Because we were radical, you got yeah. there. So just go with the flow, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, if you can't be radical with me, please just get out of the way and don't make me feel, this is hard enough without being self-conscious. Just let me be, radical. and right. then you push something inside that can work. <laughs> exactly. So, but anyway, I mean, I think that, that I always tell people that there is a role for all of us, you know, you on the inside and me on the inside, but get out of my way because if, there's more people out on the outside with no access to power and movements are about Definitely. expanding who gets access to power to get things done. So I said, if you are not, if you don't, don't want to take the risk that I am willing to take because I have people with me that, 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 that want uh, some access, then just get out of the way, <laughs> you know? So, and you have to be able to take exactly. that criticism from people. So anyways, there's so much to do, so much we could talk about. Um, how, can pe I, how can people stay connected with you? I, I follow you on, on your, on your, in your podcast because you have some, some real critical issues that people should get involved and connect. Please let, let them know how to follow you and, and, and stay engaged with you. So I'm on Facebook and I'm on all the ones. If you Google Jay Lasseter, um, my Twitter is usually on top. I'm at J underscore Lass. And that's the best way to keep the conversation going. And listen, I take the role very seriously when youngsters come to me and they need like advice or help editing a speech that they wrote. Like that's a commitment. I'm, I'm up for that commitment. And sometimes it's an ongoing commitment, you know, not just a one-time thing. So when, when youngsters need advice, if they want to reach out to me on Twitter or on the social media platforms, um, 
they can do so knowing that if, if I'm not going to be the person to square them away and leave them better than I found them, then I'll send them to somebody who will. And that's a commitment that uh, we have here at Activista Rise Up. You need inspiration. You need somebody to talk to about an issue that you're stuck. Call me, call us, and I'll connect you to the right person who's doing Amen. that work, <laughs> who is advancing that cause. And I will send you to Jay Lasseter, and I know he will take care of you. So Amen. Okay. thank you, Jay, for this conversation you're and welcome. for continuing to push forward critical issues, progressive issues for our communities here in New Jersey and nationally. So it's, a pleasure to, it's a pleasure to be on your bandwagon. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And let's, let's continue and let's vote next week. It's our power. Amen. If I were to vote, but so many causes, so many progressive causes, sometimes we feel that the needle doesn't move forward fast enough. But if we keep building, we keep convincing another person to join the cause, whether it be, be for the LGBTQ plus community, for immigrant workers' rights, for women's rights, we are building a movement to change our society and to change our politics. But first, we also got to vote. June 8th is the primary election in New Jersey. It's your opportunity to engage in the politics of your state, come out to vote and exercise your power. And then continue engaging with activists like Jay, like myself, like everybody who comes to the show who is pushing for a cause. And sometimes it feels like it's not moving forward. But if we keep at it, we will change another person's mind and we will open doors for those who are willing to change the political system so that it works for people who need help. This is Dr. Patricia Campos Medina, and this is Activista Rise Up. Join us. <laughs>